Coming up now on Animal Outtakes, creating a connection to nature. We're visiting the Crowley Museum and Nature Center in Sarasota, Florida, where stewardship and conservation go hand in hand. We get up close to some cracker cattle and learn why the history of these animals is important to all. Plus, we focus on something called a soft release program and find out why it's vital to have it in our community. This and much more straight ahead on Animal Outtakes. The Crowley Museum and Nature Center sits on 191 acres in Sarasota, Florida. It's a farmstead that was established in 1878. The property has heritage farm animals and a rare Florida habitat. Nowadays, with developers encroaching on every bit of open space they can find on the Sun Coast, this piece of property is becoming something of a rare gem. For more than four decades, the center has provided children's programming that creates a connection to nature, a way to foster stewardship and promote respect for Florida's history. Crowley is a 191 acre hub for Florida's natural and cultural history. Dixie, we've got a lot of action going on back here. <laughs> Welcome to the Crowley Museum and Nature Center. Well, we thank you, we thank you. Tell us about this wonderful place. It's a hidden gem. Thank you for saying that, it certainly is. We have about 40 different animals here. We have the chickens, as you can see, we have pigeons, we have hogs, we have goats, and we have a large herd of cattle. We do have a few of the Florida Cracker cattle, which is the heritage breed that were purchased and brought in. But the majority of these guys just needed a new home or a better home, and so they're here with us. This is one of the favorite parts that the children have for the school programs. Yeah. Do you want me to go in there? <laughs> that was great. You know, it, this is an unusual occupation for you, isn't it? <laughs> it? It is, but it's wonderful because it gives me an opportunity and an outlet to teach the things that I truly believe in. So that's Emmy, she's a female, and then Ermin, um, and he's, he's almost exactly what you would see in nature, and then Spot. Hi, sister. The two on the ends are very old. The guy in the middle um, that people found him around, Hurricane Irma, which is how he got his name. Dixie, I know that there's a lot of programs, various programs that you give here at the Crowley. Yes, and I wanna start with my absolute favorite program so that any teachers watching or coordinators watching know. We have a free Title I and special needs service out here. We do not turn students away based on the school or the family's inability to pay. We fundraise to offset the cost of those, but any Title I school's special needs, we're sure they come out. Um, besides that, we have several different uh, educational programs, including Florida Pioneer Life, where the children are immersed with costumed instructors doing the daily activities of a pioneer and learning how that differs from their lives. I teach uh, basic survival and wilderness survival 101 classes. We have several different varieties of folk school classes from canning, you know, learning to can, learning to knit, you know, textiles and things like that. And we're working on getting all these things back up and running post Hurricane Ian. In this fast moving world that we live in, do the kids adapt? Because some of the things that you've said, yeah. <laughs> they go back to pioneer days. Yes, <laughs> ma'am. You know? And uh, when you said knitting, I, when's the last time I heard somebody say, well, I'm knitting? Do they adapt to what it is that you're 
Absolutely, Gucci. and they love it. Children love to learn in a hands-on and immersive fashion, which is what we specialize in here at Crowley. Every child touches every piece of equipment. Every child participates. They learn how to do it and they see the fruits of their labors, which is an extremely, in a technology driven world, being able to see that physically in front of you is very rewarding and they enjoy it. The fresh air, the animals, the activities, it's a great experience. What do you teach them? What is one of the first things that you teach them? Um, one of the first things that I like to teach them is coexistence with the natural world. Understanding that every life, every plant life, every animal, every insect is uniquely important. It's not just how they serve or how they threaten humanity. They're important in and of themselves. So that's where we start is understanding that we're just a piece of a much larger puzzle. And all of these animals fit into our ecosystem. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, they do. The, the wildlife here, we teach about um, native and non-native wildlife, and then how you can um, incorporate agriculture sustainably into uh, conservation. We do get a lot of letters after we've seen schools. We've had kids tell us that this is their best field trip and that they want to be us when they grow up. But one thing that we always leave them with is how important they are to the future because the future is theirs and it's what we have to give them, but they can give back as well. Now you have a lot of animals here. Yes, ma'am. And they're all attracted to you, so we know yes. that you're hands-on with everybody. Yes, ma'am. Who's your favorite? Oh, can this be our secret? <laughs> well, okay, yeah, well, yes, we don't want them to know. We don't. <laughs> you're going to meet a cow today named Red and Red is responsible for saving our entire herd during Hurricane Ian. She is a special needs cow that I have raised since she was a calf and she's been through a lot of trials and she's very, very brilliant, very, very friendly and very, very special. And that does bring up a point. Uh, we are in the land of hurricanes here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we've had two big ones in the past couple of years. What do you do to protect the animals here at Crowley? Um, we, st we started planning and we have a hurricane preparedness plan. Um, at, in addition to the animals, we have a lot of historic resources here. So it's of the utmost importance that we're prepared. Um, we are lucky and we are one of the only farms that I know of that did not lose a single animal during Hurricane Ian. We lost part of everything else, but none of the animals. Um, so we start planning when we see something in the Gulf uh, that could potentially threaten us, we start planning then to secure everybody. Everybody's labeled so they know we know that they belong to us, how to get them back home and all of that good stuff. So we secure them as best as possible. And the smaller ones, um, these guys and pigeons and things, they come home with me. <laughs> They well, stay. Of course they do. Yeah. <laughs> I would bring the cows too, but I can't fit, you know, 25 cattle in my house. Sure, so. sure. We understand that. Yes. yes. But knowing you as we do, you're working on it. Yeah, I, yeah. I would. Yes, yeah. I absolutely would if I could. Part of the rescue rehabilitation we do when we take in animals is a lot of love and a lot of spoiling. They come to us with varying health conditions, um, undernourished, things like that. So they associate us with food and right now they're having a little bit of cornbread and some bird seeds. Well, they have not missed a meal and they're not missing this either. Yep, not, <laughs> nope, once they're here, they never miss a meal again. There are developers everywhere you look, on every corner. Um, as coming here to Crowley today, I came a route that I have come for 10 years, going to Dante's Den, and all of a sudden I'm looking at homes that were never there, roads that were never there, and signs that are showing that there's going to be more. Are you concerned about this, and how safe is Crowley from this type of invasion? Absolutely, we were concerned about it. And it was of the utmost importance to me and my board that this property be protected forever from uh, inappropriate or overuse of agriculture, from development of any of that. So effective last year, in August of last year, we put a conservation easement on the property that's through Sarasota County. 
that will say that even if the property were to sell at some point, it will never be developed. It's actually part, uh, one puzzle piece, of a larger continuum, including many other conservation lands that are tens of thousands of acres called the Mayaka Island. This is a safe place for wildlife to be um, so that they, as they're crowded out from the development that you saw, there's a place to be. But if we don't make a conscious effort to slow this development, even as many acres as we have here cannot sustain the wildlife that we're displacing. So that's another reason why we educate the way that we do here. So you have a living legacy. Yes, ma'am, I do, yes. And so does the Crowley family, which is absolutely what our founder wanted when he founded this place in the 70s. He wanted people, especially children, to be able to come here and continue to learn about natural and cultural history in Florida. That was quite a vision. Yes, it was, especially for back then. And I don't think it could, he could have even possibly known how important it would have become. I don't think that uh, Jasper Crowley would have believed the development that's coming out here this way now. We don't believe it, so yes. he wouldn't have. <laughs> You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. For much more on this location, you can go to CrowleyFL.org. They also have social media where you can find updates on some of the programs and animal adventures. Coming up next on Animal Outtakes. Our soft release program here is based on the idea that rehabilitated wildlife does better when they're allowed to acclimate to the sights, the sounds, and the smells of the area around them. That's next. Good morning, Mr. Benson. Your breakfast is served. Ugh, time for another day in doggy paradise. I sure am one lucky pup. Mr. Benson, would you like to go out for your morning stroll? The weather is quite lovely today. That sounds wonderful. Don't mind if I do. After all that exercise, I think I'd like to lounge by the pool and maybe dip my paws in. As you wish, sir. Right this way. Ah, what a perfect day. I couldn't imagine being anywhere else but Dante's Den while Mom and Dad are away. At Dante's Den, we pride ourselves in providing the best experience for your beloved pup. Whether it be a day, a month, or a year, Dante's Den should always be at the top of your list for boarding. With an expansive campus, your dog will enjoy daily walks, pool time, and an endless supply of love. Even better, it's all under 24-7 supervision from our wonderful staff. If you're anything like us, your dog's safety and happiness come first. To learn more about Dante's Den, visit dantesden.org. Dixie, we're here at the Crowley Museum and Nature Center, and you have some animal education programs. Yes, ma'am. So you must have some ambassadors for this program. We absolutely do. Um, we call them our animal education team. Essentially, the animals help us interact with and instruct the children on livestock husbandry, which was a huge part of uh, pioneer culture and is a huge part of agriculture. You know, treating the animals properly, proper nutrition, all of that makes for the whole experience to be better. Okay, so this is the Crowley Education Goat Team. This big guy here is Billy. He's the only male goat of the nine, and they are Nigerian dwarf crosses. So they help us teach the kids about the roles that goats play in agriculture in pioneer times. Male goats, billy goats, bucks, those are all kind of things that they're called. They usually have bigger horns than the females. We don't disbud here. Uh, we adopted her that way, so that all the females have horns here as well. We love all animals, you and I. Yes. But somehow there's a mystique, an aura around piggies. Yes. And you have two adorable pigs. Yes, we do. And they are? Uh, Mayaka and Sweet Pea are the most active participants currently in our education program. And they're good teachers, huh? <laughs> yes, they are, because they'll do anything for a cookie. <laughs> I love the happy butt when she wags her tail. And their nose is extremely sensitive, so when they're rooting around, they can feel the movement of grubs and things like that that they're after. Okay, so Mayaka is? The, the, little, the little guy? Yep. And the big one is Sweet Pea. Uh-huh. 
Well, Sweet Pea is definitely running the show here. Yes, uh, Sweet Pea came to us as a baby. So did Mayaka. Um, no one ever claimed Sweet Pea. She was starving running down Fruitville Road and I caught her and no one claimed her. So she stayed here. And Mayaka is a um, castrated wild hog. Ah, so okay. she is part of our education program regarding uh, explaining to children what wild hogs are, where they came from and the role they play in today's ecosystem. The wild hogs in Florida are considered a nuisance. They were introduced uh, by Spanish contact in the 14 and 1500s, and they are considered a nuisance due to the destruction that they cause of property, which is why any pig that we have on the property is immediately fixed so that if it ever got out, it wouldn't create to the sure. bigger problem. Yeah. Sure. Yes, they do play havoc, don't they? Uh, enough of that. Hogs are omnivores. That means they eat both animal and plant material. Um, they really, really are good at finding um, cultivated agriculture and eating that. So they get into tomato fields and things like that. Um, they can live uh, in captivity up to 20 years, a pig can. Uh, they don't usually live that long in nature, um, but they definitely can. I have always heard the pigs are very intelligent. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely brilliant. Um, we can train the pigs here to do things in half a day that would take weeks to train a dog. Um, they will teach themselves things that you would never believe. They will teach themselves to climb fences. They can open all sorts of latches and gates. They're very, very smart. Um, so we actually use that to our advantage here, explaining that to children, just how smart pigs can be. So there's uh, several misconceptions involved with pigs. The first has to do with sweating. People say sweat like a pig. Pigs do not sweat the way that people think that they do. They don't have those glands. So the other misconception that pigs like to be filthy is in part due to that. They um, coat themselves in mud as a way to keep cool, to keep from sunburning, and to ward off parasites and blood sucking insects. So that's that's what they, uh, that's that's why they do that. They don't do it because they want to be dirty. They do it as a form of self-protection. Well, they look very clean here. Yeah, they're just covered in their straw from cuddling yeah. on the cold nights that we've had. For sure. They leave you with an impression that their innocent and simple lives are important, that the quality of their lives are important. And I think when you involve animals and in teaching children, you bring an element of the outside world into the human world, uh, one that we seem to be separating from as technology increases in our lives. But it does seem like when we were working with them and, and you were teaching me and so on, they were getting it much more than I was. Yes. <laughs> so I guess they leave us with a lot of compassion Absolutely. and a lot of intelligence. Absolutely, and they're all individuals and they all should be considered. Quality of life is important, not just for us, but for the animal world as well, agriculture or wildlife. You have a very interesting program here, part of your rehab, and it's the soft rehab. What really is that? And tell us about how you execute that here. Our soft release program here is based on the idea that rehabilitated wildlife does better when they're allowed to acclimate to the sights, the sounds, and the smells of the area around them. Instead of just going and dumping, you know, a, reha a rehabilitated animal in the woods, it would be better to have them in a good secure cage that keeps them from um, predators and other sorts of threats while we supplement their feed and they get used to the area. As this is happening, we start to open several doors so they can go further and further. Water and food is supplied, the doors are left open, they can return for a couple of days and then they naturally disperse. Great way to do it. Yes, ma'am, and it, it helps with the chances of survival because they're protected while they're learning who's out here that can eat me? What do I smell out here that I can eat? And part of that program is us hiding food or making food appear in a more natural way as opposed to just a dish of food and water, which is not what would happen for them in nature. For much more on this location, you can go to CrowleyFL.org. Don't go far. 
We'll be right back with a segment on a spider most of us do everything we can to avoid. Well now, Andrew, we're looking at the dreaded black widow spider. How dreaded is it really? That's the thing. They, though it is the most venomous species of spider in the United States, they're not super, super dangerous that it's going to be automatically you die if you get bit. Most people who get bit by a black widow survive. Well, that's good news. So, <laughs> the vast majority of them. And most people who uh, die from black widow bites are very small children and people with compromised immune systems, so they can't combat the venom effectively. Um, black widows are also relatively docile, so they're not just looking to bite you. Again, do not hold a black widow spider. Do not interact with a black widow spider. It is a very bad idea. Um, I just, I don't think I should have to say that, but I'm just saying that because... Well, we will heed your advice, for sure. <laughs> um, but what have you noticed about them that that you just get so interested in them. I, the, the most of us, you know, we want to kill them mm -hmm. immediately. <laughs> <laughs> but you just kind of sit here mesmerized. Why? I, I just think it's so interesting to be able to look at things that are misunderstood in a different light. Like they're they're part of the creation. They're they're here for a reason, and. They're, they're not something I think we should be afraid of. I think we should have a healthy respect for them, which means know that they're there, respect them, and look at them from a distance. But yes, but if you come across one and we all have a tendency to know what they look like, mm -hmm. the best thing is to just move away. That is the best thing. And they're not gonna follow us. They're not gonna follow you. They do not chase people. So these spiders will stick to their webs. They will be in a dark corner and they will build a web. Their, web, their silk is relatively strong um, and they will catch things like roaches, like ants, stuff like that. So in a way, they're doing us a service. And that's their role in the ecosystem. That's their role in the ecosystem. Outtakes is produced by Dante's Den Foundation, a nonprofit group dedicated to creating the best life for dogs. If you would like to learn more about Dante's Den, donate or volunteer, visit our website, dantesden.org. We hope you had fun and learned a thing or two along the way. We'll be back here again next week with even more animals and some wild adventures. And until then, thanks for watching. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.